Hey, take it away, Tim. Hello, everybody. I, I promise I'm not that off my nap. Um, <laughs> anybody like to tell me which bike those headers are from? No? It, it's a random Honda one. But it'd been really cool if someone had just yelled out and made a model. Because I'd have gone yes and agreed with you. <laughs> and it would have looked super cool. But eh, never mind. OK. Uh, so, uh, how many people have heard about the uh, fairly recent now uh, British Airways hack where they lost lots of credit card details? Hands in the air. Anybody here actually affected? It's amazing. I've given this talk four times and no one's been affected. It's almost <laughs> like it doesn't exist. Uh, but quite a few people have, and it, it, it sucks. You know, they, it really sucks. But when you do anything to do with security, what really sucks is when you realise that it took, would have taken them one line of code to prevent the whole thing. <laughs> now, you could argue that that's down to pure laziness. Uh, you could argue that massive corporations with good big governance structures and things getting one line of code through is actually really hard. But still, we're in a scenario where just one line of code could have saved them and prevented at least their end users having any problems. Good news, I'm going to show you how to do that today. And this is not a scary talk. <laughs> this is... Yeah, yeah, the 380,000 people. Uh, this is not a scary talk at all. This is a very, just a very practical talk. Um, if you want a scary talk, come talk to me afterwards and I can scare you to death. But I appreciate that some people don't want to be scared to death and they just want to learn something. So, my name's Tim Nash. I'm the uh, WordPress platform lead at 34SP.com. I'm a former pen tester. I co run WordPress leads. I used to run a small dev agency. Uh, and I tech, go around the country speaking about security. Um, I have many accolades of disasters and doom and gloom to my name. I uh, like once almost destroyed the British Soap Awards. Please come and ask me about that. Uh, if, you, if anybody wants a hint, it's called caching, and it comes up in this talk. Uh, so it also goes without saying that please don't do this stuff without further reading. Some of the headers I'm going to show you, and even just the idea of how headers work, um, can cause you to fundamentally and utterly destroy your site forever. As in, you can get into a scenario where your domain name is almost unusable if you're not careful. Because some of your users will end up in a scenario where they just cannot be used. Also, security headers can be used for evil, which is not about this talk. But again, feel free to come and ask me about really evil uses of security headers. But yeah, please, please, please read stuff. Whenever something gives you the option of specifying a time, when you're testing, specify a really small amount. Then go to the 100 years. Really small, 60 seconds, 100 years. There are in integers in between you can use as well. But do make sure that you don't just throw yourself into this because it will go horribly wrong. Uh, and I have screwed up a domain and I've had to throw it away because I didn't. And I thought I knew what I was doing and, you know, arrogance gets the best of everyone. So, what is a security header? This is a normal HTTP packet. Uh, this is the HTML and the HTML body and the HTML head. That's the content that gets delivered. It's normally called the response content. And up here is the response headers. These are set separately. So they're not part of the HTML. They're things that go a lot alongside the HTML that tells you a bunch of information. Uh, there we go. So, uh, this is just me making a curl request uh, to my own site, and uh, minus I, because curl works that way, is gets me, returns me just the headers, and these are the headers that are sent with any content that's requested. So if you go to index, uh, ask for me, uh, my site index.php, you'll get sent back headers that look something like that. And most of these we're going to be talking about. But things that you uh, are in your he HTTP headers are stuff like status codes. It's things most people in the room will be familiar with. We've all come across the idea of a status code 200, meaning, okay, everything is good. 404s, missing. 500, well, we're going into really bad territory. That's that, how the server responds and tells you that information is done through a HTTP header. Now, once you can do that for things like, hey, can, you, can I ask for what content type this is? Text HTML. Can I ask what uh, the server is, Nginx? Why do I need to know what the server is? Can I ask for a bunch of other stuff free? HTTP headers are very standardized, um, though you can put whatever you like in there. You will find, uh, for example, 
Uh, if you go and look at some people's sites, headers, you will find things saying, want a job with us? Click this link. Or um, they're, if they're uh, Terry Pratchett fans, you might find a, a GNU Terry Pratchett header knocking around in there. Not old Clax headers. Uh, so there are lots of uses, not just security uses. Now, a header can be sent by both the web server, something like Nginx, or the application, aka WordPress. Now, if you're using uh, PHP or WordPress to send headers, they have to be sent at a specific point. They have to be sent before you start generating the HTML body. Because if you don't, well, then you get that fun error message that comes up saying, I've already sent the headers, what are you doing? You muppets. So, um, which one you choose will depend on what, head, what you want. Normally, sending the header via the web server is faster, because obviously it's not doing any work, but they're normally fixed at that point. It's unlikely that you're going to be dynamically generating your headers in your web server. If you need to dynamically generate the header, you probably want to put it in the application, aka WordPress. As a general rule of thumb, things like a HSTS header, I would probably put it in the web server. A CSP, which we'll talk about later, I'd probably put it in the application and let the application determine it, because I might be dynamically generating it depending on what page is on. That comes with its own sets of risks and issues, but it's generally probably much more flexible. Now, if I can set a header in the application, that means anything that's got control of the application layer, or basically anything that can interact with a HTTP packet, can set headers. Do you remember that bit where I told you headers are dangerous? This means that uh, any WordPress plugin, for example, could set a header that just says, turn on HSTS. Ah, I don't care if you don't have SSL enabled. Forever. Preload it. We're screwed. Also, if Bob, who's not a system administrator, decides he wants to put a header on, he can put it on, and he could potentially put it on a subdomain and affect the main domain. It's all good fun. This is why some uh, setups will actually prevent application level from setting headers. So let's start with some headers. First one, <coughs> uh, HTTP strict transport security or HSDS headers. This is probably one of the older ones that you and most people here hopefully might have come across it. The idea is most people's sites goes over uh, HTTP. Look goes over um, HTTPS, so an SSL layer. Now, if we want to say, actually, under no circumstances do we ever want the person to go over HTTP, we can say, set a header with a max age, in this case of 300 seconds, and say, uh, whenever, you, whenever you as the browser, so when the browser makes a connection, we say, hey, we want this browser connection to always go over HTTPS. Next time the site co person comes to the site, even if they put in the URL, HTTP, timnash.co.uk, it, the browser will go, no, the site told me I must load over HTTPS, and that is what I will do. And there is no way for the site to override that again, up until the max age. I will not ask for it, I will not request it again, I will just assume I must go over HTTPS until I get past this max age and I will request the information again. Awesome, we now know that our connections uh, will be always over HTTPS to our site. This is a good thing, generally. <coughs> we can, we've now increased our max age, you'll notice here. We've got a bit longer, we're, we're raving. We can also say, include subdomains. So now, anything over uh, timnash.co.uk, meta.timnash.co.uk, dev.timnash.co.uk, local.timnash.co.uk, all must be going over HTTPS. So even domains I've never thought of, the moment I create them, they must be going over HTTPS. Or my browser will say, I'm not connecting. Now, here's a real fun one. Some browsers, if you're on the subdomain and you include this, will include that for the parent. So you can own um, blah blah.wordpress.com, and if you manage to get a HSTS header on, you can force it for the entire of WordPress.com, even though you are actually only controlled the subdomain. Yay, fun! Uh, on the whole, H HSTS is a good thing, but you need to think about implementation. If you have local dev environments, 
that you wouldn't naturally have over SSL. You now have to have them over SSL if you want to include the subdomains. Suddenly, you might be all thinking, I know. I'll, um, I'll change my local dev environment to being, I don't know, timnash.dev. Uh, I wouldn't do that particular one, given that Google own the .dev domains, and they've specified that HSDS is preloaded. So you're back in the same problem anyway. Uh, HSDS, it is useful. It, it will have prevent man in the middle attack. So the idea is that I go, hello, I, I would like to talk to the master of the game. Somebody in the middle goes, oh yes, that's me. Just giving you the information. By the way, I'm just going to give you the wrong information and pass it through. Uh, so it does have a use, and it is important to use it. Just be aware that this is one of those potential ones that can totally screw you. Make sure you're fully aware before you include the English subdomains that you, all your subdomains actually are over HTTPS. We can also say preload. The idea here is that if, once we say preload, browsers will start to go around and find these preloads and put them in preload lists. You can also submit it to something like uh, hstspreload.org. Now, you have to have a certain length of uh, um, expiry time that's over a year. But you can then say, and you must include the subdomains, I think. I'll double check that, but I'm pretty sure it has to include subdomains. You can then ask the browsers to preload this. Now, this means that the browsers never have to make the initial connection to get the header. So, for example, Chrome, if you come to my site in Chrome, it never asks whether, it never goes to check the HTTPS header, because it's already preloaded in, so it knows that it should only be loaded over HTTPS. This is, suddenly becomes a really useful feature until we don't load over HTTPS. We have a bad day. We, your Let's Encrypt certificate didn't renew. Now your site can't be loaded at all. The browser will refuse. Or worse, we'll try and load it anyway, and it will just get stuck in the loop. That said, everything should ideally be preloading. Moving on. Cross-site scripting protection. This is a very simple header. In this case, it says zero. The browsers, most browsers have some built-in cross-site scripting protection. Basically, they look at the URL and go, do you know, script, a script and then a bunch of JavaScript in the URL encoded is pretty weird. Maybe it shouldn't be there. We'll try and strip that out. So you can turn it on. And in this state, it's just you can just turn it on and it will just sit there going, well, I know that that's, a de uh, that's not right. I'll put a message in console. We can also use this report. <laughs> report. So the report allows us to go to this URL and in the browser will send to that URL a JSON payload. It makes a post request to the URL that you've specified saying, hey, tell me about any issues that you've come across with cross site scripting. So I can say, hey, what did you get? And he says, oh, look, here. The, this was the request URL, and I didn't have a body. Here's the information about it. This is bad. So the browsers are now telling us when things are bad and broken. This is really cool. Because obviously, as developers, we can now go, eh, something's wrong here. We can go and fix this. Now, a couple of ideas if you are using um, things like this. One. You probably don't want it reporting to the same domain that's got the problem. <laughs> because there's a reasonable chance that if there is a problem, that they've probably got your reporting URI as well. Two, if you have a problem, every request and every browser is going to start reporting stuff to you. You can end up quite easily DDoSing yourself. And it's very hard to stop because you've told the browser to go do it. Oh, and headers get cached. So even if you took the header off, for a little while, the browser's still going to do it if you think you've been to the site previously. Um, a good service is report URI. Um, it basically is designed to provide a reporting services for security headers. Uh, they're based in the UK. Uh, they've got their servers are based both in the EU and the States. You can specify specifically through. Uh, some really, got some really cool features. So, if you are looking at setting up reporting, I would recommend looking at report URI. So, up until now, we've just reported stuff. 
if we mode equals block, we will now say, we do not want you to load that resource. I've decided that I'm pretty sure I don't have any cross-site scripting issue, things that would look like cross-site scripting attacks. So I'm willing to put mode block. Now, sensible people, we start with this, we get it reporting, when we're happy that there's no reports coming in, we go to this. Do not jump to this, because your page might not load. Because just because you think something is in a cross-site scripting attack, doesn't mean the browser does. Trust me, their rule set is pretty basic. I mean, pretty, pretty basic. In what, uh, it's not there anymore, but in an early version, one of the browsers, except if you had the word union anywhere in your URL, blocked it as a cross-site scripting attack. Which just sucks if you run unionjacks.com. <laughs> <laughs> We can also set it up so that we both have reporting <coughs> and mode block, which would be our ultimate goal. Moving on, next type is again the real header. So uh, in this case, it's just x, x hyphen. So x normally means it's outside of the standard specification. Even though these are standards that most browsers adopt, they're not formalized standards, hence the x in the front, x content type, options, no sniff. Now, this basically says um, if I load a, uh, a, a Body, inside the body and it's just got style and there's a style sheet or it's just got script and it's just got JavaScript, then do not try and guess what it is because it's told you. So if the mind type is not text, ha text slash CSS, then that's it, stuff inside there we don't trust. Likewise, if the mind type isn't uh, JavaScript or one of the, there's about three different JavaScript ones, do not trust it and do not load it. Refer a policy. This is for uh, giving information to the going forwards and backwards. So the most uh, hard version is go no referrer. So don't pass to the next URL any information about the URL you've just been on. No referrer when downgrading. That's going from HTTPS to HTTP or HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, only do referrer to my own domain because with no referrer. The page, even pages on your same site will not share referrer information. Uh, origin, your stuff. Origin, when, yeah, going down, going down, same one. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> now onto the rubby bits. Up until now, these have just been one-off headers. Content security policy is a single header with lots of information in it. And in many ways, CSP has um, subsumed a lot of the stuff we just talked about. Cross-site scripting protection can be done purely with a CSP. They work hand in hand, though, so they can because you the CSP will block based on what you tell it, whereas the cross-site scripting protection blocks on what the browser was thinking about. So a CSP policy. We'll start with something simple. We set a default source. So self, my site. We can say that um, unless I tell you otherwise. The default source for everything should be self. Self and everything in friend.com. Because, you know, so by default source, everything should either come from self or my friend.com. <coughs> so, default. You, if you, rather than using self, if I don't want to specify, uh, if I want you to only be loading over HTTPS, I don't want to put subdomains, I don't want any, I want to make sure it's protocol specific. I can put my actual domain in there. We can then say, OK, so for, for images, I want to load from anywhere. And uh, for scripts, so for JavaScript, I want to load from self and friend.com. So my default source for most things is myself, but I'm being override. So each time we add these steps, we're overriding the default. For images, I, I'm not, I, you can load them from anywhere on the web. I don't care. The scripts must come from self or friend.com. Oh, we can report stuff. Yay! This is good, because now we're going to get information back. And DDoS ourselves when we get this all horribly wrong. Uh, so a report coming back will look something like this. Again, it's a JSON payload. Has, now, the amount of information that's given to you will totally depend on the browser, because what Firefox gives you is different to what Chrome gives you when, yeah, well, other browsers do exist. Uh, but yeah, so they, they, what's in there will change depending on things. And if you've got your um, 
However, whatever you've set as the referrer policy obviously affects this as well coming through. So we can also set our content security policy to be report only. When setting up your CSP, set it to report only. Because if something violates your CSP, the browser will block it immediately. Your question's asked, that's what it does. It will tell you in the console, and it will report it to the uh, report URI, but it will block it. Let's go back through. Scripts. We could do uh, self, and by default, uh, just because something's in self, if we, unless we specify unsafe inline, any script that is inline, or any style that's inline, will be said no, because it's not being loaded as a remote resource from self. So we could specify in our script source unsafe inline. That would be bad. Because we don't want unsafe. I mean, the fact that it's got the word unsafe, in, unsafe there probably gives you a hint. This is bad. But this basically means we're going to load scripts and say anything that's on the page arbitrarily, just let it go. <laughs> Obviously, if somebody can get a inline script on the page, maybe they've managed to get an injection on into your uh, posts, into a post, that will just process. We don't want that. No, all we can use is a nox. Uh, so we can have our, man, our random nonce, and then we can say, okay, for this nonce here, my random string, anything that's got that nonce as well, we'll let that run. But we won't let it run unless that's there. So we can specify these nonces. That's brilliant. That makes life so much simpler. Uh, so then we can say, actually, we can specify even the remote script. So my trusted script, yep, it's got a nonce. So we can specify it for whether it's inline or external. It's got a nonce. If it hasn't got a nonce, we're not going to load it. You see, nonces only work if they're randomly generated on each page load and that they're actually random and that we can be used once, hence the name. If we cache the page, we've cached the nonces. Now, we could break out of the caching, but then we've broken out of our caching. Suddenly, if you want a high-performance site and you want to use nonces, you either have to lose some aspects of the security or you have to lose some aspects of the performance. Or apparently Yahoo lose high performance all. Uh, so, let's go for an alternative. Instead of using a nonce, let's hash the results. So if we go back here, we've got our script. We, put, we go to our script and we actually put, make a hash so SHJ256 hash of the that whole content. That's everything from this point here to this point here. We hash we hash that every and all the content inside of it, and then we can specify that in our content security policy. So now there is obviously a minuscule chance two identical blocks of code could have the same hash. But if that happens to you, run to the nearest place, buy a single lottery ticket, and then buy your airline ticket. Because you've won. There's no, that, that, that's, yeah. So, but on the whole, this is a pretty safe way of putting in hashing. Now we just need to hash each time. Great, because code never changes. We never push out new builds and stuff. So this should work 100% of the time, very efficiently. And actually for static sites, or sites very rarely changing, this is quite a good system. If you've got anything that's going to be dynamic and changing regularly, you're going to have to start thinking about build scripts and how you want to modify your build scripts to generate out SHA 256 hashes. Are you going to? Seriously, if, you think, if you've had to play with caching and you think that screws you, you've never tried checksumming something. Because it's amazing. You'd think that the whole point of a checksum is they, they should be identical. That there is no way that that checksum could possibly change. Yep. They do, on all sorts of things. Whether you used a Windows machine to do the checksum or whether you used a Linux machine to use the checksum can make a difference to what the result of the checksum is, depending on line endings. All sorts of fun and games you can have. Checksumming is never as easy as it comes across. Which leads us on to something else. Sub uh, SRI, sub-resource integrity. Uh, this is basically hashing again. But instead of putting the hash in the header, we can actually specify uh, integrity here is this. So now we can say, hey, this, this script, which is a remote script, I know about this script, uh, and I know the hash for this script, and you should only load 
is this script happening? You don't need to use the security header for this, you can do this on each script. Now, so we can say, I know about all my scripts and I know what the hash is going to be. Now, we can also then specify in our CSV, you must have an SRI for script and style. So every remote, every script that is loaded, every uh, style that is sheet is loaded, every inline script that's done, every inline style that's done must have an SRI. Brilliant. This is a really good world because now you cannot change anything on my site without there being an SRI and you have to generate an SRI if you're going to hack me. Hackers don't tend to go around going, I must add some integrity checking just to be on the safe side into the system. It happens though. But we can also make sure that we then use the same hashes in our CSP to say, and I will only load these hashes. Brilliant. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's not. It, it should be. It should be a lovely future. Up until you realize that you load Google Analytics. Because Google Analytics, you can do an integrity check on what that particular file is now, but it will, it's remotely controlled by somebody else. It will change. It's dynamic in its nature. It changes on every page. We've got JavaScript they deliver back. Then, just to be more fun, you remember when we said require SRI for scripts? That includes scripts that scripts load, which means we basically now need to know all the SRIs and have SRIs set up for every single pe script that Google Analytics loads or YouTube loads. They load a lot of extra scripts from lots of extra domains. Just writing a CSP policy that can manage to get YouTube to load properly is masses of extra domains in there. SRO is brilliant. Um, if you have a small static site using SRO, works really well. If you have a site that is uh, on the front end is very light, it works brilliantly. Trying to build even just a basic CSP for WordPress admin areas that you don't, and trying not to use the words unsafe inline is nigh on impossible. Because every single plugin loads in and some of them will enqueue things beautifully. Cool, we can grab anything that we enqueue and we can hash that. They do an inline. That action, we might be able to find the action hook and find it. We can buffer the output and hash all of that, but then we might have just buffered the bad stuff as well. We don't have any standardized way for just adding styles on the admin area that is used. We have hooks and options, but at the end of the day, someone will go, Yeah, but I'm just going to shove my scripts in the footer. We have no way of grabbing that information and knowing which ones are legit and which ones aren't. Um, if anybody has successfully managed to create a CSP that is actually not vaguely safe from, uh, in the admin area, I'd love to talk to you because I've been trying for about two years to come up with various ways to do this. And barring being incredibly selective with my plugins choice, which is how I succeed, so I can do it from my own personal site, that's fairly easy, but then I only have half a dozen plugins and I've wrote most of them and I know what's being queued and I've gone through each page carefully decided that this isn't a good state, and so then I've gone and put various hashes in. If you've got clients and they have a tendency to go, I know, I'm just going to install that e-commerce software over there, and that one, and that one, and I want it read, yeah, and changing everything, then you are screwed. Your, your admin area will never be in a nice state. But you can work on this stuff on the front. And so as much as CSPs are really designed for both ends of the site, Using a CSP and using all of these headers, they're here to protect your users. In many ways, they are here to provide the protection for your users, not for you. Because if you need to trigger a bunch of this stuff, you've probably been hacked. That's probably bad for you. Now we're trying to prevent malware being spread, we're trying to prevent people using your site for DDoSing other things. So this is all about protecting your users, and as such, the front end is a good place to go. How would a BA, the BA hack been solved? Well, if they had a content security policy that just specified which domains they were going to use and just set it to themselves and a couple of trusted partners, 
that would have blocked it. If they used SRI, that would have worked straight away. If they just used any form of hashing on the, the resources, it would work. It's interesting. Uh, BA now have a CSP policy in place. It wouldn't prevent the hack. <laughs> well, they have one now. <laughs> Improvements. There's just one more header. This is uh, and headers are being added all the time. But uh, this is a really cool header that I actually haven't implemented on my site yet, but I will do. And that's feature policy. You can actually say, hey, browser, I, um, I'd like you to uh, specify that I actually don't need to use the accelerometer today. Uh, I don't need to make payments. Uh, I don't need to use the uh, gyroscope. I'm not going to ask for your geolocation and any of that. In fact, I don't want to use the USB. I just want to just be left alone. And you, so you can specify which features should be on and off. This is actually is really useful because um, things like uh, push notifications and payments and all these interesting little things that you can trigger to get the site to start using, we can turn off and make sure that they're just not going to be abused in any way. It also stops your developers from, if you're a sysadmin and you really don't want them to put up little things that says, please share our location because you just hate them and you think that the UX designer doesn't understand it yet, you can just turn it off and prevent them from ever accessing it, and then claim you don't understand how it's not working. <laughs> uh, if you want to go check out uh, how your site's doing currently, uh, you can go to securityheaders.com, and you can put in your scan, click there, put in a scan, it'll bring back all the information, it will also link to how to implement them in various ways. Uh, report your RI, which I've already talked about, um, and observatory.mozilla.org, uh, which is basically the same thing again, but uh, through Mozilla. I told you this wasn't scary. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't feel mildly traumatised. Come on, someone's got a question for Tim. Right, Louise? So you certainly lost me on how you do solve that problem if you can't cache things and you can't... Oh, sorry. So, uh, which, so what can you do? Okay, so uh, you can't... It, for caching, uh, we go back. So using nonces, yeah. uh, which we generate each time, uh, that, if we cache it, then we're screwed. Yeah. So to get around that, we hash the actual content itself. So we've got the hash, which we know doesn't change, and we just you, we put the hash for each one in there. So we wouldn't have just one hash. We'd have, if we had 10 scripts running, we'd have 10 hashes inside our policy. So, so your build script would have to generate those hashes yeah. um, on deployment, because otherwise, obviously, the code would have changed. Yes. Right, OK. Yeah. Uh, do I have an example which has a hash in there? No, of course I don't. That would be way too easy. Uh, but I, you'll notice that in my CSP, I have been safe in my bin there. But it is for style, not source. Uh, but uh, that also gives you an idea of just how many various Twitters and YouTubes and video. And you'll find lots of it. For, um, to load YouTube, you need um, it to be in your image, your source, your uh, frame source. Uh, your media source, and actually to get it working with some of the older browsers, you also need it in bed source. Not just YouTube, you also need UI, whatever it is, I can't remember what the, the sub ones for that is. It's a pain. Use video press, apparently, they only, at least only need it in one location. But yeah, so you'd use an SRI, you have, but you'd have to generate that in your build script. Anybody else? Yes. Um, the, the self um, policy, um, it, is that limited to just the website or any plugins that use external resources? Uh, yeah, no, if it uses external resources, if, it's load, if the external resource is being loaded by the browser, that is considered something not self. Okay. If the website was making a curl request and then returning it itself, that, that would depend on self. So one of the options for getting around some of the stuff with Google Analytics, for example, in fact, uh, quite a lot of people who like to get 100% on Google PageSpeed, they like proxying Google Analytics. That initial analytics source, if it was proxied, would be itself. 
But if you were just to include Google Analytics GA JS from Google, then that wouldn't be yourself and that would be included. Tim, are these slides available online? They are. At a URL that's mm -hmm. on screen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Oh, hang, hang, well, let's do that one and then do that. Tom, who's no doubt going to do a comment rather than a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> my reputation is on that. <laughs> um, you mentioned that new headers are added all, yes. all the time. Who is it that... Browsers. Um, browsers. The, 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 uh, so a combination of the uh, InfoSec community as a whole, ha there are mechanisms to allow them to communicate with browser companies. Um, um, but yeah, it's the browsers who implement them, and like, just like anything to do with browsers, some browsers implement stuff quicker than others, and some don't implement stuff at all. Uh, so there is a little bit of uh, can I use this style setup, and in fact if you've ever used can I use for uh, anything to do with JavaScript and CSS and stuff, uh, most of the security headers are on there as well. Uh, they're actually planning on separating and making a separate section um, on there. So hopefully, uh, most browsers, so CSP is uh, every major browser supports. With the, the, only, uh, the only one that's not supported by every major browser that I've shown you today is feature policy, which I think is only available in Chrome and Firefox, but it might be in Safari as well. Surprisingly, um, Safari are pretty good at implementing security headers, which is weird. They're rubbish at implementing anything else. <laughs> and this is the, their own stuff. So. Tom, do you have a question or have you got a big a long question. statement? <laughs> um, so I've been trying to, I, I, a while ago I found securityheaders.com and I tried setting up my own content security policy. And I don't, there were a few headers I wasn't aware of there, but there was, you talk about unsafe inline. I tried to eliminate unsafe eval, I think it is. Um, and ended up breaking half the Ruby admin, the media manager wouldn't work, Yoast yep. wouldn't work. Do you know anything workarounds that to try and change the code so that it does uh, work? Yeah, so, um, I, so I managed to get, after about a year and a half of swearing, I did manage to get most of the media, media stuff working. Uh, anything that is enqueued, properly enqueued, um, using WordPress hooks, is fairly easy to do because we now know what we're getting in the payload and so we can create a hash for that and we can normally modify the output that it's being put on the screen. Uh, where it falls down, the moment a plugin gets involved, you're A, fighting for control over who, who, who's modifying that action first, but also you end up in a scenario where you don't know what that content should be or shouldn't be, so you don't you have to treat it as untrusted. And that's where it all falls down. So it is possible to do it for most hooks and features. A couple of places I couldn't get it to work properly. Um, uh, Gutenberg, you just can't get it to work. But that's... That's not going there. That's not going there. Uh, but yeah, Gutenberg can't get it to work just because of the nature of how Gutenberg works. I probably could if I spent the next two years trying to do it. Um, I, have a, I have a demo working with me, with the class editor and everybody has everything set up with media working. Uh, oddly enough, the dashboard itself it, it has a bunch of scripts that are added that aren't enqueued properly, and they just generate in the foot, um, just for reasons. And the uh, settings page, again, has some save bits that aren't enqueued properly, and they're just there. And once anything that's not being enqueued properly is basically where you're going to fall down. Um, there isn't any particular uh, will amongst people, as far as I'm aware, to try and make this better either. Which is a shame, but because uh, it is quick wins. But the problem with that is a quick win for WordPress core. But it's, as we can't actually set this to enforce, because we know we'd have to get every single plugin to do this as well, it becomes an academic issue really. Because until we can work out a way of making enforcing that for plugins, and even if we could get these to enforce for plugins, we might be then whitelisting scripts that we definitely don't want to whitelist anyway because it's the plugin that's been hacked and it, if we automate the uh, ability to whitelist things it won't take too long before somebody a bad actor goes oh well i'll just enqueue my script properly then job done <laughs> so 
This wasn't the rosiest of talks, but it's a better talk than normal. <laughs> well, that was an excellent talk. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If folks do have questions, uh, I am around for the rest of the weekend. Please do come and approach me. And if you just want to come and chat about security stuff, please do come and talk to me. Uh, I always like talking about security.